When it comes to satire, very good satire can be indistinguishable from the real thing. Think of all the people that watched the Colbert Report and thought that it was legitimate, instead of just making fun of them. In this case, I also can't say if this is satirical or not. It may well be. I hope it's not. But if it is, it's irrelevant, because regardless, we're going to use this as a little exercise in critical thinking and also having some fun. So let's check this video out and see what this guy has to say. I am so pumped to be talking about today's questions. It is one of my favorite ones, and I'm going to share my secret weapon with you. So hang on to your hats for that, and we'll get into it. But let's look at how... When these people say secret weapon that they have to share, I get a little bit concerned. How to witness to an atheist. Uh, and like I said, I'm going to share my secret weapon with you on this from the Bible that I think is really going to change the way you approach atheists. But if you came... Okay, it's just from the Bible. So the worst it could be is, I guess, chariots. You're looking for help. You're trying to witness to an atheist. I'm glad you're here. Let's talk about it. So jumping right into this, an atheist is someone that doesn't believe there is a God. That is the definition of an atheist. But let... Well, correct. But I should also uh, define something for our viewers who may not be that familiar with Christian terminology. Maybe you've just never heard it before. Maybe you've been involved in it and forgot about it. This video is called How to Witness to Atheists, and the reason it's called that is because Christians who are going about their great commission business of spreading the word of Christ far and wide call what they do witnessing. I mean, it's like a missionary thing. If you are trying to share the word of the Lord, the good news with somebody, you are witnessing to them. So that's what he's talking about. Just some added context. Let me tell you something that you need to understand going into. And I don't suggest you start a conversation with this, but it's knowledge that you need to interpret this well. First of all, as I like to tell people, the A in atheist stands for angry. Here's the thing. No one... Oh, yes. I am definitely a very angry person. Can you see the anger written all over my face? I think I am just one of the most, you know, rage-filled people in the history of rage-filled people. Look at me. I, can you not see just how, like, sheer anger runs through my veins and, like, just drives every action in my life? Like, can't you see that? One doesn't believe there's a God. In fact, this is why we don't have anti-leprechaun or anti-unicorn clubs. Because everyone knows leprechauns and unicorns don't exist. And so we don't create whole social clubs and organizations dedicated to letting little girls and little boys know that there's no such thing as unicorns. There's no such thing as leprechauns. If there were people who were raising young children to believe that there were unicorns and there were elves... I think a lot of people would have a problem with that. I think it wouldn't be to the same extent because I don't think the belief in unicorns or elves has that much uh, potential to harm, unlike religion, which has a lot. But I think people would still be opposed to that. You didn't see really any anti-flat earth groups until the flat earthers started emerging. And yes, we think that flat earthers are very harmful and very dangerous. So we do have groups of people that respond to them consistently and try to undo all the damage that they are doing. Now, again, I don't think the unicorn people would be that dangerous, but if you're going to be saying things that can hurt people, you are going to inspire a reaction to that. It has nothing to do with whether a thing or not is really real. It has a lot to do with our perceptions of reality and what it means. This is why Santa Claus doesn't make half the people mad. We, we know he doesn't exist. Yeah, sure, he distracts from Jesus, but he doesn't exist. He's he distracts from Jesus. Now, there is a hot take for you. Um, but if, you know, I, I think the Santa thing is very interesting because if you look at the idea of God in Christianity especially, what is it if not something that works exactly the same way? Kids are taught that Santa exists, but after a point it becomes hard to keep up that particular lie and nobody wants kids to believe it forever. Religion works the same way, except parents don't usually say to their kids, well, it was all just, you know... It was all for a good purpose. It was to make you feel good. It was to give you something to look forward to. With Santa, we can do that because adults don't think Santa's real, but adults do think God is real. So they never exactly pull the rug in the same way as with Santa Claus. If, on the other hand, there were a large contingent of Santa believers who made Santa into a religion, again, that would be something I would have a problem with. He's not real. And we don't have organizations dedicated to spreading information about how it's not real, writing books about how they're not real, because they're not real. And we all know that. The fact that you're mad at something, the fact that you're against something, is actually evidence that it exists, uh, which is... Well, I mean, you're the one who's red in the face, my guy. ...kind of hysterical backfire for the whole atheist worldview. Uh, they wouldn't be upset about this. Uh, they wouldn't be talking about this if it wasn't real, so that's... 
Imagine if like everything went by this standard though. Imagine if like anything a person got mad about means that thing is real. I have been mad about some silly things in my lifetime. I have watched movies and gotten mad at characters we know are fictional. Like really, like genuinely angry at them. Uh, Oppenheimer, which of course I love quite a lot, as you can see. Um, Oppenheimer, if you haven't seen it, I won't ruin it for you, but there's a character, actually a couple of different characters, but there's one main character who's just a really bad guy. And uh, watching that movie, I can't help but feel a little bit angry at this guy. But he doesn't exist just because I get angry at him. And, you know, but on a related subject, I don't think I've really gotten angry at the concept of God, as it were. Really fun fact to start your day off with, the reason they're mad about it. And the reason I say that atheists are mad at God, that they don't believe in him, what they're essentially trying to do is get back at God for their... For, for not doing things the way they want. Most people, when you... What does that mean exactly? It, I mean, in what way should God be doing things according to my will? Um, yes, I do find it very suspicious that things like the Holocaust happen if a God is real. But that is not like my main argument for the existence or non-existence of God. Rather, my argument for the non-existence of God is just that the universe seems to work in a natural way, such that whether there is a god or not, you couldn't tell if there were a god by looking at the universe. That's the main crux of my argument. I do have others, but that's the main one that got me even as a kid, that when people would describe all these miraculous wonders of reality, of nature, and ascribe them to God, I would just be like, something doesn't sound right about that. I don't know what yet. I haven't figured it out, but something doesn't sound right about that. But there are plenty of reasons why people don't believe. I assume some people are very different. But that's just mine. And you talk to them about God, and you're like, well, hey, why don't you believe in God? Here's how that conversation will go 90% of the time. Well, if God was so good, why bad things happen? So either he's not good or he's not powerful. What they do is they hit you with the problem of evil. Uh well, the problem of evil is a valid response. I mean... There are plenty of people who have decided that the problem of evil is a real problem for religion and the subject of God specifically. Um, I think Bart Ehrman is a good example of that. He was a fundamentalist Christian who went into Bible scholarship, and then he became more of a liberal Christian over time, and eventually he stopped believing in God altogether, but it wasn't because of anything he learned in the scholarship. It was because of the problem of evil specifically. And... I used to think that the problem of evil was kind of like overrated, but now, as I've gotten older, I tend to see the problem of evil as more of a real problem for Christianity because as I've gone on, I've realized that Christians just don't have satisfactory answers for it. They can have uh, explanations of why it's a thing, that evil exists in the world because of man's betrayal of God and introduction of sin into the world and all that stuff, but that doesn't really have the explanatory power they think it has because who created evil? Why is evil here? And uh, sometimes they'll say, well, Satan created evil. Well, Satan has the powers of creation. Well, yes, sure. Okay, well, who created Satan? And why would you create that guy if you knew he was going to create evil? I like to extend this argument to olives a lot. I am not a big fan of olives. If I were the creator of the universe, I can tell you one thing I would never have created in uh, an infinity, an eternity. Olives. But, you know, if I did, and I had to deal with the existence of olives, if, if I created them as a god... And I went out to get a pizza at a pizza place. Let's say God goes pizza shopping. And somebody put olives on my pizza. Well, that's a problem I created, isn't it? Because I did create olives. So, yes, Christians don't really have a satisfying response to that question, in my opinion, and in the opinions of a lot of other people. Some people aren't as bothered by it, but I certainly am. A philosophical conundrum for a good while. If God is love, if God is good, if God is powerful, why do bad things happen in the world? There are a lot of answers to that. Uh, my All of them trash favorite being that God is using man's sinfulness to display his glory and love for us in an even brighter way. You there are better ways to do that, and if I, a human, can see that, surely the creator of the universe must also be able to see such a thing. You can't see light if there's no such thing as darkness. There's an equal and opposite thing. Do we really need as much darkness as the Holocaust or childhood leukemia or the Rwandan genocide? or babies dying on mass in or in mass uh, in Palestine. Do we really need that to understand the light? And also, what light uh, can you really bring up in response to that? What light resulted from the Holocaust? I would really like to know. 
asking for everything. That's one of my favorite answers for the problem of evil. We can go into depth into that more. But atheists are angry at God for not doing things the way they want them done. So when you start dealing with... No, I don't expect any God to do things the way that I want them done, because I don't think there is one to do that. But if there were one, I would certainly have a lot of questions as to why things are done a certain way. Like, if there are things that I, as a human, see as being silly in how the world works, surely an omnipotent, omniscient creator of the universe would have seen that long before I did and been like, hey, maybe I should fix this. With an atheist, what I like to do is look at classical apologetics for starters and then move into presuppositional apologetics. I'm going to talk about what those two things are in just a minute. In fact, the presuppositional is my secret weapon, and I'm excited to tell you about that. Classical apologetics, there's several great arguments to come across this. My favorite uh, argument is the watch in the field argument. Uh, and so when I dealt with some atheists actually on the boardwalk of New Jersey not too long ago, I used this dealt with some atheists. That is very interesting phrasing. And also, while we're paused here, just to comment on that one thing, I want to point out his shirt. It says, always be reforming, because Christians just have no sense of, like, catchy sloganeering and such. Uh, but I think it's in kind of interesting how his beard, like, when he's, like, moving his head side to side, just flies over it, and yet never blocks it. And that right there is an excellent... Uh, I guess, argument for the existence of God. The fact that that beard somehow isn't blocking that out. That's got to be divine intervention, if you ask me. This illustration, I said, if you were going in a field and you found a watch in that field, how do you think that watch got there? And they both said, somebody must have dropped their watch. And I said, what? You mean you don't think this, this is a watch field? And if I fertilize it and plow it and water it, that it'll start growing Rolexes and I'll get rich? Harvest the well, yeah, that's correct. You see, we know for a fact that humans create watches. We know for a fact that it's nature that creates, you know, these fields that plants grow in. We know that nature grows these plants, although frequently with human assistance. We have never in nature seen a watch grow up because watches are a human invention. We can chart both of those. We can chart both of those uh, evolutionary things over time, you could say. We can chart the evolution of species into... Um, fields of flowers, for example, we can, we have DNA evidence that shows the linkages between different species of plants. Uh, watches, on the other hand, we also have sort of like a good history of watchmaking, because humans make watches. This is not, uh, an incredible gotcha. Thing my watches? And they're like, that's stupid. And I'm like, exactly. So the fact that there's something that's clearly designed in the middle of a field where we know if you left a barn out in that field for 100 years, it'd just disintegrate into nothing. We know that for a watch to be there, someone dropped the watch. We know there's a God because we have intelligently designed things all around us. We this is not a great argument, and I'm not sure why he thinks this is a great argument unless he's just never heard the arguments against his position because intelligent design creationism is a farce, and it is a farce that has been apparent to even fundamentalist Christians who have seen it and been like, well, that's just silly. Um, so let's talk about this just for a second, really quick. Let's try to cover this in an easy way. Humanity, as far as we can tell, has no signatures of design similar to a watch. You find a watch, you'll find all kinds of little indications that it was created by a person because they always are. I mean, pretty much everything about a watch, um, you're going to find that it has been created by a person. With humans, that is not the case. What we find instead is DNA in the fossil record. And what do these things reveal to us, you might ask? Well, let me explain. The fossil record and DNA both weave an intricate picture of reality for us, where they tell us this. Humans are a great ape. We don't really differ from the other great apes by a whole lot. We split off from their... from uh, the shared ancestors, uh, between six and about 20 million years ago. And we have pretty good records of the fossils for, you know, that prove sort of like that, you know, missing links, the Christians always call them. We have a, a good fossil record that shows the evolution of humanity over time and also the evolution of other species like chimpanzees and gorillas, things of that sort. We have that. We also have DNA, which further shows our linkages to these species. DNA, uh, if you found just one of these things, the fossil record as it is, or DNA, you'd have bang on evidence for the evolution of these species. But we have both. And what we find is they work together. They work in unison. 
the DNA shows the linkages of these species in exactly the ways you would expect them to be linked. And that's not always the case. Uh, sometimes the linkages do surprise us in nature. But when it comes to the closest species to humanity, the other great apes, the linkages are exactly what we would have expected them to be. And it's legitimately incredible. And that is not what you would expect from a designer, that is what you would expect from evolution by natural selection over millions and millions and billions of years. So that's all I wanted to say about that particular point. So let's see what else he has to say. We know these things don't pop up from nothing. We've never been walking around the road and BAM! Molecules align to give us a new car. It doesn't work that way. Um, and so even a- yeah, Again, cars were created by humans. But, you know, we do have evidence that at one point there was more or less nothing, and then suddenly there was a bunch of stuff. Now that's simplifying a little bit. Let's be clear that, that I'm simplifying it for his ability to understand it, because I suspect that this is not the uh, brightest bulb in the sock drawer. And uh, so let's put it like this. We have evidence for the Big Bang. We have an enormous amount of evidence for the Big Bang. We have, among others, the cosmic microwave background radiation. We also have evidence for an expanding universe in the form of cosmic inflation. These two things alone are enough to tell us that the Big Bang happened, but we have even more evidence than that. And, and pretty much every prediction we make about the Big Bang and evidence it should leave behind turns out to be correct. That's pretty impressive stuff. So we know that the Big Bang happened as well. We know the Big Bang happened, set all this off, and over just billions and billions of years, over a, over a Sagan unit, um, we ended up having life on Earth, and that life led to us. We know these things. We can chart these things. We have legions of evidence. We have just mountains of evidence. And the fact that you don't know about that evidence does not mean it is not out there. Atheists have to apply their own logic to try to understand these things. And I, and I, I always challenge the atheists, hey, if you wouldn't use this logic to explain a watch in a field, why would you use this logic to answer away your problem of an eternal destination and God that immediately affects you right here on Earth? And Even if you proved that there was an intelligent designer and that there was a God, you'd still have one really big problem. You'd have to prove it was yours, because even if you somehow managed to prove to me that intelligent design creationism were true, even if you managed to prove to me that evolution were false, the Big Bang was false, even if you managed to disprove everything I think about how the universe works, which you can't, by the way, um, even if you were able to do that, you still haven't proven that it points in any way to your God. And yes, your book makes claims. Your religious people make claims, like, you know, your... your co-religionists make claims of divinity and such, but all religions have essentially these same sorts of claims. So you would still have to convince me that your religion was the correct one. Now, to be sure, if you've convinced me that there is a God, that there is an intelligent designer, you've gotten a lot closer to that. But that doesn't mean that you're going to get all the way there. I mean, there was one um, atheist philosopher who, towards the end of his life, he was convinced that uh, some of the arguments in favor of the existence of God were correct. Now, some people say that towards the end of his life, he was dealing with mental problems and, you know, dementia or something like that, and was manipulated. And I'm not saying that's the case. He could have genuinely changed his mind on God based on arguments he decided were more reasonable. That could happen. It happens sometimes. And I don't know. But what I will say is this. He did not end up a Christian, even though the person who convinced him there was a God was a Christian. He ended up a deist. The reason why is because even though he had decided that in fact there was a God, ultimately he had not decided that God was the Christian God and had seen no evidence towards that end. So you still have a big problem, even if you convince me my whole worldview was wrong. And they usually just kind of blow that off or whatever. And that's fine. That's that's their issue. But here's the secret weapon. And here's what I like to point people to. So number one is every atheist deep down actually believes two things. They know they have an eternal destination and they know they are guilty before God. And this is your secret weapon. This makes no sense. Um, for one thing, again, an atheist is somebody who does not believe in God. So no, we do not think we have eternal destinations. Um, my partner is a Catholic. We talked about the idea of an afterlife. And what I said was, I think the most likely explanation is that the afterlife, as it were, is a lot like before life. You just return to the void. And when I think about dying, I don't really think of it being, like, a bad thing. I mean, obviously it could hurt. That would not be good. Um, you have to leave people behind. That's also not good. But I don't think of it, like, as a bad thing in terms of what happens after the moment of death. 
If I had the secret awareness that God is real, especially yours, I would think about death very differently, I assure you. Let me tell another story. Um, there was a gas leak at my house. And as you know, gas leaks are quite serious. And I was living with my parents, as I do sometimes. And the day of the gas leak, um, the gas company, upon being called, said to evacuate the house. For obvious reasons. That shit's dangerous. It blows up. People die all the time from gas leaks. And, uh, of course, nobody else was taking it seriously. I mean, my, my parents are fundamentalists. They don't tend to take the idea of dying very seriously anyway. So they weren't taking it seriously. Um, me, on the other hand, I immediately went outside. I mean, I literally got my backpack, threw my computer in there, headed outside. Walked down the street, away from the house. Walked until I could no longer smell gas because, yes, the gas buildup was so strong I could smell it all around the house. Not great, as you can imagine. And then I went and hung out at my uncle's house for a, for a little bit. I had my dad drive me out there. And on the way there, he seemed to do a typical Christian thing of just completely missing the point. And he said something like, you know, um, let's see, whoa. It's hard to phrase exactly, what, but let me just give you the gist of it instead of trying to phrase it like you. The gist of it went something like this. Um, for somebody who isn't worried about hell, you sure did jump up and get out of there for fire. You'd think you'd be concerned about hell. And the answer is no. I know real fire exists. I know in this universe there is fire. I know in this universe explosions happen. I am not convinced that hell is real. If I were, I would have a similar reaction of jumping up and trying to get away from it, most likely. I mean, you can't really say for sure what you do in a situation like that. But if I thought that there was the slightest chance that hell was real, I would jump up and get out of the way. Just like if I thought there was the slightest chance of this house blowing up and going up in flames, I would get out of there, much like I did. So I think that kind of, like, disperses with this Christian argument immediately. Again, I don't like fire. When I thought there was the slightest risk of fire getting to me, I am out of there. No far in me, I tell you what. Um, but when it comes to hell, I am completely unconcerned. And not because I think it's some far-off thing, either. It's not like this thing where I'm just waiting to the last moments of my life to pray for salvation and not go to hell. No, it's... I have almost died before, actually. Like, you know, actually almost died. Really close. And in those moments, I wasn't thinking about heaven or hell or any of that stuff, or God. Actually, I think my thoughts mostly just sort of turned off, and I felt at peace with whatever happened. But this story is getting really long. Let's, let's keep it moving. Weapon, because the Bible tells us about it in both of these verses. We know that the law of God is written on the heart of man, and we know that every man knows that he is destined for an eternity. Some... I don't believe your book, my guy. Why would I care what it has to say about me? And they know that deep down. So I actually really prefer a Ray Comfort-based style of evangelism. If you are not familiar with Ray Comfort, uh, the oh, the Banana Man. Living Waters YouTube channel is kind of the main place uh, I go to see that. I've watched a bunch of their videos with youth groups. And Ray Comfort is like the one of the sleaziest Christian apologetics guys out there. I think the only person who beats him in sleaze is Kent Hovind on a technicality that Kent Hovind is just an all-around piece of shit. Uh, Ray Comfort, probably a better person, but as far as apologetics go, still very sleazy with it. He relies on heavily emotional arguments to make his case, and he tends to prey on people he finds to be kind of weak. If he were to run into somebody like me, he would probably run away. I don't think Ray Comfort would take on somebody like me, and, and for that matter, I don't believe this guy would either, honestly stuff to help train kids in evangelism but Ray Comfort has a great way he works people down the idea that they can make mistakes and so they shouldn't be the ultimate authority he works down the ideas of we all stand guilty before God and we need a savior he's really great at that but when you are approaching an atheist here's my thing number one you need to know they actually believe God exists and that's something you need to keep in your back pocket no no um you know, I could easily say the same thing about you, that the reason why Christians proselytize so hard is because they secretly know God doesn't exist, and that information makes them very uncomfortable. I could say the same thing you do and be exactly as right as you are, which is to say, not at all. They're mad at God. Look for the hurt. Because when you can find the emotional force that's driving their argument and realize that this is not a logic-based argument, because logically, duh, there's a God. This are you kidding me, my guy? Are you kidding me? That is just silly. 
because logically, duh, there's a God. Okay, I would like this guy to diagnose the root of my anger. What am I so angry at God over exactly? I don't think of myself as a very angry person at all. I have been hurt by Christians, but if if it came down to it, I wouldn't say that that has anything to do with how I feel about uh, the subject of God specifically. It does make my views of religion very negative, but the subject of God specifically, I think, would only be tainted by the fact that that person would let things like the Holocaust happen. This is an emotionally based argument. That's where you're actually going to minister to the person. And there's a good chance that if you can minister to them and their hurt and their need and their anger, that's actually going to be a better place to start before trying to logically convince them of constructs they're not capable of understanding because they're so emotionally involved in their hurt and their pain. So This is just the full-on irony hour, I think. Has this man ever actually met an atheist before? Start by ministering to them there. Maybe you want to use some classical apologetics to frame the argument and make a worldview where they understand logically, scientifically, the best explanation for how we're here is that there was a God. But So how does uh, science, DNA, the fossil record, the Big Bang, point to the existence of God exactly? I mean, this man probably doesn't even believe those things actually happened despite the mountains of evidence for them. Then move into your secret weapon. Know that deep down, they know they have an eternal destination. Deep down, they know they have violated the laws of God and they need help. You know who violates the laws of God constantly? Uh, Christians. You know why? And in the Bible, it's always said, basically in the New Testament, it's always said that Christians, that people who follow Jesus, should uphold the old laws. What do you want to bet this guy eats pork? What do you want to bet this guy has eaten shellfish? What do you want to bet that this guy is wearing mixed fabrics in this very video? What do you want to bet that this guy has never stoned a gay person for being gay? What do you want to bet that this guy has never stoned uh, an adulterous woman for being that? What do you want to bet? I would bet a lot on that, actually. And then we just have faith, because the best answer for all of our problems is, in the words of Andre Crouch, Jesus is the answer for Jesus the world today. Holy... Mother of God, that was loud. I was going to have some kind of summary at the end of this video, but now my hearing is kind of like shot, so I think we're going to have to skip that for this time, but this guy does have other videos I'd like to check out, so once my hearing recovers, we'll uh, do that, okay? Okay, thanks for watching.